I'm John Emmons, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for June 3rd, 2023. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and rising U.S.-China competition have rapidly changed American understandings of the threat of war and the role of the military in the post-9-11 era. To consider how things have changed in recent years, for this week's Archive episode, I selected an episode from October 2016 in which Benjamin Wittes sat down with Rosa Brooks to discuss her book, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, Tales from the Pentagon. Wittes and Brooks discussed her time as a civilian advisor at the Pentagon, the history of the laws of war, the expanded role of the American military in a time in which the lines between war and peace are increasingly uncertain, and if it is desirable or even possible to rethink the distinction between wartime and peacetime. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, October 1st. 2016. That was Rosa Brooks, a law professor at Georgetown University, a columnist at Foreign Policy, and a senior fellow at the New America Foundation. She joined Benjamin Wittes at the Hoover Book Soiree this past week to talk about her new book, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, Tales from the Pentagon. The two discussed the increased role of the military in an uncertain world, along with the shifting boundaries of war and peace and of the frameworks of law that govern them. How should we think about the military's responsibilities outside the realm of traditional warfare? And is it desirable or even possible to rethink the way we approach the distinctions between wartime and peacetime? It's the Lawfare Podcast, episode 190, Rosa Brooks on how everything became war and the military became everything. So Rosa... This book covers an astonishing amount of ground. I mean, it's part, it's part memoir of, uh, although it disclaims that and says it's not a memoir. It, it's it, not a memoir. It, it's, <laughs> it's part memoir of, of your time at DOD. It's part uh, uh, history of the laws of war and sort of the effort to tame war as war has changed. It's part uh, argument that the... Uh, contours of uh, uh, about the nature of sort of protecting human rights in the context of of, of post 9/11 national security operations, and it's part um, uh, speculation and rumination on sort of the future of of war and an argument that the military has has taken over sort of too much too much territory uh, bureaucratically and substantively relative to other parts of the government. And so my question is, what's the big idea that holds all of this together? Uh, and what, what's, what's, the, what's the core message that you're trying to send w- with, with this combination of stuff? I think the, 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 there are a lot of pieces to the book, as you, as you say. Um, and uh, partly that actually reflects the this uh, low-level war with the publisher who wanted more anecdotal and personal stuff. And, and I, of course, wanted to write a long law review article. Um, and we kept going back and forth on that. And, and they kept saying things to me like, could you just cut the law stuff? Because it's kind of boring. And I kept saying things like, no, I can't. I'm a law professor. And then they'd say things like, well, you know, our only difficulty figuring out how to do the publicity for this book is we feel like every time we use the phrase law professor, we sell five fewer copies. <laughs> and, and I get very depressed. Um, but so the, the, the part of the book that's actually most important to me uh, is, is the really, in some ways, the, the first part of the title. The, in the title is How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything. Um, so for me, the most important piece of the book and the most important argument in the book is that uh, when we have a binary legal system that says, pick, you can, have, you can have the law of armed conflict or you can have ordinary law, uh, but you have to pick one and they're each quite restrictive in different ways. Uh, one is very restrictive of government power, the other is much more permissive of government power. We have a binary legal system in a non-binary world and we're facing threats that are not binary. We're facing threats that don't look exactly like crime. They don't look exactly like our sort of traditional notions of war. And as a result, uh, a lot of things are getting sort of shoehorned into the war box and having really distorting effect on both our law and our politics. I think for me, that's the most, that's the piece of the book that is closest to my own heart. 
um, although uh, it's not the only piece of the book, as, as you've said. So the first section of the book is a discussion and elucidation of the expansion of military function. And I was fascinated by this because I, I was going through it trying to figure out how much of this is really expansion and how much of it is just actually what militaries have traditionally done amped up. So your first, your first example is piracy, um, which is, of course, a tradi very traditional naval function. Um, and you know, one of your other early examples is, is AFRICOM, which you, know, you describe, I think rightly, as a sort of uh, subrogation of a lot of traditional State Department activity. And so I'm, I'm interested in your kind of gestalt sense of what are the areas that the military is doing today that are not what we would think of as traditional military functions, but are some other kind of uh, things we would normally associate with other branches of right. government. And that's actually, that's an important distinction, right, that, that one of the things that the book ends up challenging is the idea that we, there is some set of military functions that, that is uh, uh, set in stone, as opposed to the idea that we, we come to associate certain activities with the military, um, but uh, that hasn't always been the case. It's not the case now. Uh, we don't, we don't, we shouldn't automatically assume that just because they don't fit into our our sort of set of assumptions about what militaries do, that therefore it's a bad thing necessarily. It may have bad consequences, but uh, but but I think I think that what we on the one hand um, have militaries and the U.S. military throughout history done plenty of stuff other than fighting. Yes, absolutely, no question about it. Um, uh, sometimes on a large scale, sometimes on a small scale. Um, when you think about the uh, U.S. occupation of Germany and Japan after World War II, clearly we had uniformed military personnel engaging in a really wide range of uh, what we might think of as, as governance and economic development functions and so forth. Um, I think you can also look back at uh, hundreds of years of human history, and more often than not, you find militaries doing all kinds of things and not sort of staying in their box. And, and one example that I love is, of course, the, the British East India Company. Um, you could say, well, was that a, it was a, it was a for-profit company. Uh, it was also a military. It was also a government, and nobody worried that much about it. Um, so what's new now? Um, I think that what is new now, I, I think that we have two things seem to me to be different now. Um, one thing is that it has to do with our own assumptions about roles and the sort of set of uh, assumptions that Americans have formed in the last 50 or 60 years about civil military roles. Um, and I do think that in the last 50 or 60 years, sort of after the end of the uh, German and Japanese occupations, um, I do think that we began to think of the military in a narrower way, and the story that the military told itself about itself began to emphasize, once again, the sort of core fighting functions and uh, what today we might call stability operations or phase zero operations was, was categorized rather dismissively as, as mutwa, military operations other than war, as a sort of side thing that you occasionally have to do every now and then when political leaders make you, but that is, is totally marginal. So, so partly what happened is that we, we narrowed our notions of what militaries do so that then in, in recent decades, as the role of the military has expanded again, we don't look at it as a reversion to various previous historical norms. Instead, we look at it and say, oh my goodness, the military's gotten out of its box. What are they doing? Launching microenterprise loan programs for Afghan women. What are they doing? Trying to come up with you know, soap operas for Iraqi audiences. That's, that's, that's bad. Um, and I do think that the, you know, after a period in which we just weren't involved in as many conflicts, uh, in the post 9-11 universe in particular, uh, as we've begun to frame the world as one in which threats can come from anywhere and take any form, and they may not take traditional forms, they may take the form of cyber attacks, for instance, uh, uh, or they may, you know, even 9-11 obviously involve non-traditional weapons, civilian airliners and non-traditional combatants, that, that as we've begun to view the world as one in which the next scary thing could come from anywhere and take any form, 
that we've, of course, begun to look to the military, and the military has begun to look to itself to say, well, if the threats could come from everywhere and be anything, then we have to be involved everywhere with everything. Uh, because how else can you gather information? How else can you form relationships, et cetera, uh, that will stand us in good stead when the next bad thing starts to happen or that will help us prevent the next bad thing? Um, the other thing that I think, though, that is different is obviously very different, you know, think back to the, the, uh, you know, the mid-18th century, um, is that we, in the post-World War II Western world, we've developed a set of ideas about uh, transparency, about the rule of law, about human rights that have become uh, codified. They have filtered down into domestic law. They've filtered down into people's everyday assumptions. And we're much more troubled as a result when institutions kind of get out of their box than, we, than people would have been 50 years ago, 100 years I mean, Maybe these are actually related points, but, uh, you know, that we, we, we worry about it now because we have these sort of elaborate sets of rules and institutions that are designed to keep each institution in its own lane. And we're really confounded and troubled when they get out because the normative goals we have in creating those rules and institutions become harder to achieve. So I want to hold that thought because we'll, we'll sort of come to, come to your argument uh, about the continuum of peace and war uh, in a little while. But it's, it seems to me that there is, there is an argument in, in the first section of the book that there's something anomalous about a world in which when the United States has diplomacy to do in Africa, it's doing it through the military, uh, when um, that we're under-investing in the State Department relative to the military. Um, and I'm interested, you know, so uh, Corey Shockey, who's a fellow here at Hoover, has written sort of the flip side book, right, which is, uh, I forget the exact title of it, but the theme of it is sort of why the State Department the State really Department screwed sucks. up everything. Right, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. and so we, have, really we like, have to yeah. invest in the, you know, the military basically has to take on all these State Department functions. And so my, my question is how much of the effect that you're describing yeah. is a function of military mission creep? And how much of it is a function of the institutional underperformance of other organizations? Oh, you and talk about government. mission creep like it's a bad thing. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, it's both. It's a, I mean, it's a vicious circle, right? Um, and 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 mission creep isn't always a bad thing, right? Sometimes missions creep because situations change and new threats appear and new challenges appear and you adapt on the fly and we look back and we say, ah, mission creep. Uh, but, but sometimes that's not such a bad thing, right? Sometimes it's natural and it's inevitable uh, as long as you're consciously aware of that's, that's what's happening. I think it bothers us when we think it's, it's uh, unplanned and unnoticed, but not necessarily just because the mission changes. Um, but but, I, but I, I think it's a vicious circle um, and to somewhat oversimplify the, the way it works. I think that, um, you know, and you could start at any random moment, sort of chicken and egg problem, you know, in the post 9-11 world, uh, we have begun to view, uh, as, we, as we try to grapple with novel threats that come from novel quarters, we have begun to view more and more kinds of security threats through the lens of war. Uh, as we view them through the lens of war, we, we bring more and more into the ambit of the law of war. We also begin to view more and more things as military missions. Uh, the more we view as a military mission, the more we need to expand the capabilities, budgets, et cetera, of the military. The more we do that, we have to look for savings elsewhere. So we go and we try to freeze or cut the budgets of the civilian agencies. The more we do that, the more their capabilities dwindle even further, even if there were various internal dysfunctions to start with. Their capabilities dwindle. We turn to the military to pick up the slack, and everything repeats itself. So I don't... I don't think there is any single strand of causation there that I would, I would pull out. Does the State Department have its own substantial internal dysfunctions? You bet. Um, is the State Department also underfunded, neglected, ignored on the Hill in all kinds of terrible ways? Yes, you bet. Um, so so I, don't, I don't disagree with Corey, but I think that uh, it's, it's, it's only part of the picture. And yet... You're, you're describing it sitting here as 
a, an effect that one can look at as positive or negative. In the book, you definitely link it to uh, a tendency to uh, degrade human rights norms. Um, not, not the State Department yeah. side, but, but, but the, the sort of militarization yeah. of everything. I don't and think I, I do. I think that's a different issue. OK, um, so, so break yeah. that out for me. There's a yeah. whole section of the book where, where you describe the threat to human rights mm -hmm. uh, of a lot of policy decisions that are somehow thematically related here. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, so tease out for us where, 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 the, where the erosion of human rights uh, expectations mm -hmm. comes from okay. in, this, in this big soup. Yeah, so let me say what I'm not saying. I actually couldn't care less which institution does what. I'm, <laughs> I am radically agnostic. I don't, I don't think it matters in the slightest, whether it's the military doing micro development for Afghan women or whether it's the State Department. I think that that's completely arbitrary. I care that whoever does it, does it well and does it in an, in a, in an accountable manner. Uh, uh, but I, I think that uh, what you could see is the militarization of U.S. foreign policy and what many people have called the militarization of U.S. foreign policy in other ways is sort of the civilianization of the military. And you could choose to see this as a good thing or a bad thing. I think in and of itself it is, it is neutral. It depends on, you know, it depends on whether we do it well and whether we do it badly, whether we do it transparently and accountably or not. Um, what I do worry about, and here's, here's I think, getting to, to your question, Ben, what I do worry about is, is, the, is the following. Um, when we choose to look at issues through the legal lens of war, that has, that has very specific uh, implications, that the, the law of armed conflict, which, which you know, Ben, I know you're, 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 you're a non-lawyer who knows more about this area of law than many lawyers do, um, but law of armed conflict, we lawyers call it by its fancy lex specialis, it's special law. Uh, it applies in special circumstances. The special circumstance in which the law of armed conflict applies is, of course, armed conflict. Um, the one thing that law of armed conflict never does is actually define armed conflict. Um, so you have this body of law which applies in this special circumstance, um, and it's supposed to apply in that special circumstance only, and when it applies, it displaces ordinary law, the lex generalis, the general law. Um, the 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 law of armed conflict relative to ordinary law is much more tolerant of uh, state secrecy, more tolerant of uh, lack of accountability, lack of checks and balances. Um, uh, uh, it is more tolerant of the state use of lethal force, other forms of coercion, surveillance, censorship, you name it. And we tolerate all those things in, in the, the special world of the law of armed conflict because we are sort of culturally uh, accustomed to thinking of armed conflict as an exception to the normal state of affairs. You know, that, that, that warriors can, be, can behave in, ma in a manner that we would regard as immoral and illegal in peacetime during war, and that's okay because war is bounded in time and in space. It's the exception, not the norm. Um, what I think has, has happened in the post-9-11 world, not because of a government conspiracy, but primarily just because of changes in the real world and a legal framework that is not kept up, is that as we view more and more threats through the lens of war and kind of shovel them into that law of armed conflict framework, we move more and more spheres of U.S. government activity in particular into that world where we are much more tolerant of, of secrecy, lack of accountability, et cetera, et cetera, um, which, which when we are, again, dealing with a conflict that is clearly bounded in space and time, we know where the war is, we know when the war is, we know who is in the war, not necessarily a huge problem, but in our post-9-11 world in which war has blurred and expanded, in which we're defining more and more threats as war, it's kind of sweeping more and more things into that war category. And that's a I think fundamentally it's a, it's a political choice to view things through the law of war framework. It's not, a, not driven by the law, which doesn't tell you really quite when to apply it or what to call an armed conflict and what not to call an armed conflict. And I don't even think it's a political choice. I, I tend to part company with many of my friends uh, in the human rights community who say, 
oh, you know, when the Bush administration or after the Obama administration says that, you know, a drone strike in Yemen is is part covered by the law of armed conflict because it's against the combatants and they're just that's just wrong. It's not war. You can't apply that law. I think that's it's not that they're wrong. It's just that we've reached a point where it is impossible to have any principled or coherent basis for deciding when to apply that set of legal rules and when not to apply that set of legal rules. You can, you can and I have, sat in, in rooms full of really smart lawyers, some of them working for the U.S. government, some of them working for international organizations, other countries, NGOs, and everybody argues until they're blue in the face, you know, well, clearly the law of armed conflict applies to this drone strike in Yemen, clearly it doesn't. And, and you can go on and on and on forever, and the law will never answer that question because basically it is just a political decision which category to apply. That I do worry about because I do worry that two successive administrations have found it very convenient and expedient to err on the side of deciding that the law of armed conflict applies to pretty much everything because pretty much everything is connected in some way to armed conflict, and that takes whole areas of government activity sort of out of the public eye and into that much more permissive framework for state violence and and state secrecy. So I take it what you're saying then is that the bureaucratic question of how much you assign to the military has a certain set of path dependencies associated with the the legal question of what yeah. box you're playing in. And Toward the end of the book, you depart a little bit from that. And you say, well, we're actually operating in a kind of zone of twilight. Um, we should be honest about that. And we should acknowledge that the activities that we're engaged in now and likely to engage in in the future have elements of both war and peace. Um, so my question is, how do you think about a military, uh, which is a question you don't answer in the book, but what is a military that is part war and part war making and part, you know, not civilian because it's military, but it's operating in this sort of twilight area bet between war and peace, the mm -hmm. sort of center zone of that continuum you describe. Yeah. What does a military that does those things look like, and what does the law under which it operate look yeah. like? So I think, uh, what does a military look like? I think obviously the challenge for the U.S. military today, and it's a it's a huge challenge, and I don't I don't envy the people who have to figure this stuff out is that at one and the same time you have to prepare for good old-fashioned conflicts right where people are shooting at you and people are blowing stuff up and your enemies are states and that that still happens that hasn't gone away um, and at the same time of course you have to try to figure out how to navigate this world in which the the threats could come from cyberspace they could come from the long-term impact of climate change, they could come from a bioengineered virus, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really, really hard because I think it, it does tempt military leaders to think we have to be good at absolutely everything and do it absolutely everywhere, which is, in, of course, is impossible, even for an institution as, as large and well-funded as the U.S. military is. Um, I do think that what a military that was better prepared to play in that space, in that in that gray zone, as uh, some call it, or the the space between, as others call it, um, would would, however, have to break free of some of the military's own forms of path dependency. Uh, we still obviously spend an enormous amount of energy and enormous amount of money on various kinds of weapon systems that are probably going to be irrelevant. Uh, and are anachronistic before they're even done. Um, I think we also, uh, I think we also have to take seriously developing the sort of cultural and linguistic competencies that will enable us to do that threshold task of figuring out in a world where threats could come from everywhere, but we can't do everything. How do we even triage and figure out how to set priorities? Well, you have to, you have to know something about the world to start with and know something about other cultures and know something about non-state actors in region X and in region Y and how they're different from each other to even make those decisions about 
where do we focus our limited resources? And we don't really yet even have those competencies entirely within the military, although we have them much more than we did right after the 9-11 attacks. Um, I got... I got myself into a little bit of hot water a few years ago by suggesting in a, in a column I wrote, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but not completely tongue-in-cheek, that the uh, U.S. military ought to stop recruiting at American high schools and instead recruit senior citizens at the annual AARP conference. And everybody said, you know, well, that's crazy. Um, but I wasn't completely joking because, obviously, if we think that, if we think that the military is going to need to address, is going to be the only institution left standing that is able to address governance challenges, economic development challenges, et cetera, et cetera, uh, then we need to not be half-assed about developing those competencies. If we think the State Department is not going to suddenly be re resurrected as a, as a major player, well-funded, et cetera, uh, if we think that we're going to continue to face these gray zone challenges, then we need to build those competencies in a more serious way than we have, have yet, although there have been some sort of interesting efforts, you know, the regionally aligned forces in the Army, for instance, to try to go in that direction. If that's the direction we want to go in, if we want to have a military that still preserves its traditional war fighting capabilities, but also expands its, its cultural competencies and its competencies in those other more quote-unquote civilian areas, then it's not particularly clear. Our, you know, our model of recruiting is still very you know, 19th century, right? We recruit young men who are really good at carrying you know, heavy packs and for long periods of time and persevering when they're being shot at and so forth. If what you want people to do is launch microenterprise programs for Afghan women, it's not obvious that you want to recruit 18 to 24-year-old males, right? They're just not the demographic we, you know. But, but, but so we, you know, we really do in many ways still have a military that's kind of, we recruit and we, we train on a kind of 19th century model. And as I said, that's not going away, which is hard. But at the same time, as we take on, if we want the military to be better at all these other tasks, and I think we are at the point where we do, then we need to get much more creative about how we recruit, how we train, how the personnel system works, and the degree to which people can come in and out of the private sector, in and out of the NGO sector, and so on. But I'm interested in, in the law of the gray area. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, the problem that you describe is that you've got this binary switch where you throw it on and you've got the Lex Specialis and then all of a sudden everything gets permissive and secret <clears throat> and you can do drone strikes and you can do, you can do all kinds of stuff. And, but you've got to put a lot of pressure on, and you and I have both written about this, you know, terms like imminence, terms like self-defense in order to throw that binary switch. But once you throw it, you've got a lot of latitude. But if it's not on, if that switch is not on, you're in civilian land and you don't have access to those legal tools. And what you're describing, and I agree with you, is, is a, 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 a legal zone in which that switch is flickering. And um, I'm interested in what the law of right. the of the yeah. of the Rio stat looks right. like if you know rather than rather than the sort of bureaucracy yeah. of the of the yeah. Rio stat. It's the hardest question, but I think it's it's harder in some areas than in others, right? Um, um, so take something like take something like the U.S. targeted strikes, with shorthand, you know, drone strikes. Um, um, which don't seem to fit well in either of our either of our two sort of binary frameworks, um, um, and it makes a huge difference which one we choose to apply, right? If we think that that guy in Yemen is is a combatant in an armed conflict, uh, then then there is morally and legally speaking, there is absolutely no difference between using a missile fired by an unmanned aerial vehicle to kill him. Uh, and an American soldier on the beach at D-Day firing at a German. There's no moral difference. There's no legal difference. On the other hand, if we think, wait a second, um, you know, law of armed conflict, really, is there an armed conflict between, between who and who, or that group doesn't pass our smell test for associated forces of al-Qaeda, or that guy doesn't seem like a combatant, or if he's a civilian, doesn't seem to be participating directly in hostilities, or whatever. Once we, then we say, ooh, wait, this looks like a murder. This looks like an extrajudicial killing. And we really want to know the difference, right? We want to be on the right side of that one, not the wrong side of that one. But we don't have any, anything in between. And most of us, I think, have a very powerful instinct that this is, 
not like the beach at Normandy, but that this is also not like some guy who's a criminal suspect uh, who's accused of, you know, conspiracy to commit murder here in Washington, D.C. That being said, I think that the the legal framework, which would need to be developed because it doesn't exist right now uh, for that space between, is often not actually all that complicated to develop with a little bit more imagination. Because when you take something like drone strikes, you know, we get, we get, our imagination gets very limited by the legal frameworks we have. And, and you say something like about, say, targeted strikes, you say, well, what if there was some sort of quasi-judicial review? And people go, ho, 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 no, you can't have a court on a battlefield, ha, ha, ha. And we all go, oh, that's, that's right, of course, because we, we're thinking of the beach at Normandy and you think you can't have a court at Normandy. On the other hand, when we are targeting people whose identity we have known for days, weeks, months, even years, who we've been tracking for days, weeks, months, or even years, all the logistical reasons behind the law of war framework, which is itself you know, an artifact of the relatively recent past, but they're, they're not there. You know, in fact, you, of course you could have some sort, you've got plenty of time for some kind of judicial process, you know, and you could solve presumably all the issues about classified information and so on. Those are solvable. You know, it's not, I actually think that it's not necessarily rocket science, that drone strikes are different from cyber challenges and so on. So it's not one legal framework that is one size fits all. It's several for different kinds of issues. But I, I don't think it's inherently all that complicated to say, hey, We've got these things that look like they don't quite fit, um, and we we have these we have these national security goals that we want to achieve, um, which is to say we want to have the flexibility if there is a really serious threat and it doesn't fit neatly into one of these boxes, we still want to be able to do something about it. We don't want to be arbitrarily constrained by anachronistic legal categories, but at the same time, you know, we want to make sure that those same anachronistic legal categories don't lead us to do something that when you kind of extrapolate to, well, what if everybody on, what if all states start saying, hey, we get to kill anybody anywhere based on evidence that we get to keep secret uh, sovereignty, no barrier to military action because we're the unilateral judge of who's willing and able to take appropriate action. We say, oh, we don't like that either. Then we think about, we've got these goals we want to achieve and we've got some values that we want to, that we want to be consistent with as we act. It doesn't seem that difficult to me to come up with a set of legal rules and institutional safeguards to, to, to accomplish those things at the same time. All right, so one of the things I loved in this book is the way you used uh, a lot of anthropology and sociology literature to sort of flesh out the way we think about war. And I'm gonna turn all that against you uh -oh. right now <laughs> and say, you know, like, there's, I thought that stuff was really persuasive, that, that, that you, you sort of develop this idea that, that war is a really, really old idea, and we, we have spent a lot of time and intellectual energy to put it in a box. And crime, which you don't talk about in the same way, you, is also a really old idea, that societies have norms, and when you violate them, they reserve the right to punish you. Um, and you could, you could do a similar yeah. sort of sociological, anthropolo anthropological sort of typology of, of crime in, in the history of, of societies, modern and primitive. Um, there is no similar thing for this gray zone. Yeah. And I want to push back on you a little bit and say, that box matters, that, that there's a reason why when a plane flies into the World Trade Center, we say, hey, is this war or is this crime? And that's because there's, I don't mean it's genetic or something, but there's something very deep in us culturally mm -hmm. that has these, and cross-culturally, that, that takes these two categories yeah. very, very seriously. And... I, Part of me says what you're describing is, okay, let's invent a new box or a new, a new set of communications between these two boxes. And that that's, uh, that's easier, that, oh, that all the literature you cite, all the, the, the anthropology you cite suggests to me that that may be a little bit more easily described than done. And that, that these two boxes are like deeply, deeply meaningful in, mm -hmm. in 
people's minds. I, just one example of this. You know, we have this inane debate over whether to close Guantanamo or not. And what does it really represent? It really represents which box we're, we're, we're operating mm -hmm. in, right? Are we, are we in the box where this is a war and therefore it's okay to have Guantanamo? Right. Or are we in the box where we should be? And so my question is, why, why are you confident that, we act, that those boxes are not pretty hardwired into who we are and that, that we can actually kind of turn around and create like a new one for gray area. Yeah, I'm not confident actually. <laughs> um, but so I, I guess I'd say a couple of different things. Um, you know, one, one is that while the boxes are maybe kind of hardwired, or I don't know if they're hardwired, but they're certainly, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a human society that hasn't had a concept of war and warriors and a set of norms and rules associated with war and warriors and a concept of what it means to be uh, a peace, peace time and a civilian. Um, but that being said, the where the lines are between the boxes, where the walls of the boxes are, how big the boxes are, and exactly what content we put in the boxes, the rules we have, have varied enormously from society to society. You know, so, so I think part of, so there, I think there are, I guess, two different types of arguments that I might make in response, uh, which I hope are consistent. Um, one would be, one is, and there's an argument in the book about the nature of categories and what it means to create linguistic categories and the ways in which these categories inherently can never capture all that we want them to capture, but also the fact that, you know, we get to change categories, you know, that they're not handed down by God and the old Norse and the Navajo and the Mikeo Indians of Micronesia and modern Americans can define and can and do and have define war and what, what it means to be a warrior in different ways at different times and can change them. That they're, they're not set in stone, that even though the, the idea of the categories may be something that is obviously, uh, you know, really goes very deep in, in human society, um, that that doesn't dictate what's in the category. So one way around the problem is you can say, I don't care, you can call it all war for all I care. Go ahead, it doesn't matter, it's just a word. But then let's say that we're not, instead of having one set of rules that apply for armed conflicts, to oversimplify it somewhat, we're going to have we're going to have a much more layered system that says, "Hey, they're all different kinds of armed conflicts, and we're going to have different sets of institutions and rules for different ones, even though we're going to call them all the same thing." You know, and, and obviously to some extent we already have that, right? The law of armed conflict does differentiate between, and you can get into these incredibly boring discussions of some of you are like NIAX and IAX and stuff. Some of you are twitching already. I can see it, right? Um, but but so one way to do it would be would be to sort of work within that framework, but to simply say, hey, okay, you want to call you know terrorist threats worldwide part of an armed conflict? That's all right. Um, but then let's just make sure that we're not applying rules that were designed for one kind of conflict to achieve one kind of objectives to this very different kind of conflict. So that's one way to do it, is you could say, keep your categories, let's just, let's just expand. Just enrich the laws yeah, of war. Yeah, sure. I mean, that, that would be one, one method, right? Um, and I should actually, as an aside, the, the law review article that ultimately became the book, the germ for that article came, uh, I was asked by a philanthropic foundation that uh, the uh, Open Society Foundation, Soros's philanthropic venture, they said, they said, we want to put together a powwow of people in the human rights community to, and people, you know, uh, ethicists to talk about the question of whether the law of armed conflict is adequate for the challenges posed by terrorism. And we want to commission one person to write a short think piece saying, yes, it is, and another person write a short think piece saying, no, it's not, and could you write the no, it's not, and we'll pay you a little bit of money. And I said, oh, sure, you know, I'm broke. I'm a junior faculty member. I'll, I'll do any, I'll say anything for money. Um, you know, and, and that debate, and this was back in 2004, this was before even the Abu Ghraib revelations, so this is pretty early on, and the, the, the debate that became crystallized within, within the human rights community was one that was essentially like, so is the problem here that uh, 
the law of armed conflict is the wrong framework or is the problem that the law of armed conflict needs to be changed and adapted and updated. And there was a there was a, almost a collective decision within that community to say, oh, no, no, we cannot say that the law of armed conflict needs to be adapted and changed for the very simple reason that we don't trust the Bush administration. The minute we acknowledge that there are any gaps or any problems with that framework, they're going to, you know, give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Nothing good will happen. So we have to say, you know, that framework is fine. You're just making a category mistake and you should use the other framework, the human rights framework. And that was a political decision on some level by that group to say that, right? Um, but it could have been a different one. It could have been, yeah, you know, we think that this, there's nothing wrong with having, putting things in that box of war and armed conflict. It's just that we think that that, that, that legal framework, given the types of conflicts and the types of actors in those conflicts, no longer achieves the normative goals that we believe that the Geneva Conventions, Hague Convention, et cetera, were originally designed to achieve, the humanitarian goals, the rights protection goals. So that would be one way to do it. The, the other way to do it would simply be to say, and, and I, 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 I'm actually kind of ambivalent about what I think about this, um, would, would simply be to say, yeah, it may be that every human society forever and ever and ever has had this category called war and this category of not war and never the twain shall meet and we need to keep them separate. But it is also the case that things do change and maybe we are at a moment in which technological changes have so dramatically altered the, the threat landscape in which it is possible for the first time in human history now for power to be exercised both, both through lethal force and through non-lethal means by, by a tiny group of people over many, many other people in ways that you just, you, you didn't have, you know, whether you want to think of, again, lethal force, whether you want to think of, you know, the, up until really quite recently in human history, if you look at millennia of human history, it's a recent development that one person or a small group could kill scores of thousands of people at once, you know, that we were limited by our technologies. Killing was slow, you know, you had to throw a lot of spears at a lot of people, uh, and it took time. Um, and with the advent of, of, of first, obviously, you know, artillery and uh, more recently uh, nuclear weapons and so forth. Um, this is the first time in human history that you can kill, you know, on a mass, mass scale very quickly. It's also, I think, the first time in human history that we have possessed the technologies uh, ranging from sort of cyber technologies to the kind of just around the corner, still slightly sci-fi-ish, you know, bio bioengineered viruses and so on technologies that you could manipulate and control vast groups of people could be manipulated and controlled by a tiny group of people again really really quickly in a really mass way and that this is actually new you can make the argument this is actually new and that so what if for most of human history we've had these two binary categories um, because we didn't need to have more than two binary categories um, but now maybe we need a third and the fact that you know the fact that we haven't had one in the past it just tells us that we haven't needed one in the past so why be limited by, by the technological developments and imaginations of prior human societies? So there's another area where you are quite critical of the human rights community or part company from the human rights community, um, which is the uh, newfound obsession with killer robots. And uh, I, I, have a, I have a dog in this fight as I've, I've- You have a killer robot. I've been one of the, com <laughs> I've been one of the combatants in the, in the killer robots debate. And I, I, I was, so my heart was warmed by your, <laughs> by your discussion of, uh, in favor of killer robots. Um, but I'm interested in this in light of what you just said, which is, okay, so if we're, if we're creating a new zone, legally and we're reserving the right in doing so to think outside the traditional box of the law of armed conflict and the traditional box of mm -hmm. of of the criminal law you know how sh how should we think about the killer what about robot? the robot well, well yeah right <laughs> like what 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 about the moment where you know whatever your bureaucratic entity conducting the operation the functional operation is a swarm of little nanobots, um, and they're relatively autonomous. I, you know, is is this a zone that we sort of shouldn't 
try to imagine until the day it's upon us and kind of do legal review at that point? Or is this something we should be, you know, as the human rights community and to a much more limited extent, the military is kind of gaming out mm -hmm. prospectively. Like what's the right, I mean, the military says, wait until you have a technology evaluated in the context of the expected use. The human rights community says, you know, no, let's prospectively decide what's off the table. Like what's, wh so they're both talking about the laws of war. Mm -hmm. If we imagine the same question in which the law is totally uncertain, right? How, what's the right way to think about a completely speculative set of new yeah. technologies? So I'm not an expert in these technologies, which, which, uh, uh, I think probably does matter. Actually, I think I think we we tend to sort of go, ha oh, ha, you don't need to know anything about cyber cyber to actually talk about cyber. I, you know, but so so I I put that caveat out there. I I I don't feel like I'm sufficiently expert in the technologies to be confident of anything I'm about to say. But you know, it it seems to me that that obviously, uh, of course, you want to think about, of course, you want to think about law and values. Uh, before you start willy-nilly creating technologies that you haven't thought about how they're going to be used, um, I don't think anybody actually disagrees. With that. I don't think the military disagrees with that um, either. You know, and I think I think there, for different reasons, in some ways, there's just as much anxiety within the military about the idea of you know cutting humans out of the loop. Um, um, so so yeah, sure, you want to think about how could these things be used and how do we feel about that and if we think they're going to be used in ways that we're really uncomfortable with maybe we don't want to go down that route of technological development that being said i think you know history does suggest that there's always someone willing to go down that technological route even if you're not and you get into these little arms races where you start understandably saying well you know, if the whoever's are going to be less scrupulous, then we've got to develop the technology too, and then the the legal framework is always playing catch up. Um, I'm not. I, I mean, I I just as I said, I don't know enough about the technologies to know how goofy and alarmist the most alarmist uh, pictures are. Um, I'm inclined to think that they're probably a little bit more goofier and alarmist than than their relative com their respective communities want to allow for. Um, so I mean, I, I feel like I should say I don't like killer robots. I just I just I don't. It's not that I think highly of killer robots. It's just that I don't think that highly of human decision makers. So you know when I we do well. I mean I think that the, the sort of classic critique right is um, oh my gosh you know in armed conflict there's just you know you have to comply with the law of armed conflict it means you have to distinguish between civilians and combatants and that is such a fundamental legal and moral obligation how could you possibly entrust it to a machine you know to which my response is humans are horrible at that we you know we're we're awful at it um, and just as the driverless cars turn out to drive much more safely than we humans do you know, I suspect the robots are going to be significantly better at making all of those decisions than we will because they don't get panicky and scared and we don't have eyes in the back of their heads and they can have cameras in the back of their heads and so forth. And they're whatever I'm imagining, the humanoid robot naturally with all eyeballs all over the place. Um, you know, so, so I can see no reason whatsoever rule-based decision-making is something that machines are actually really good at and humans are pretty crappy at. Um, so, so on that level... You know, I think that you bake in the rules, whatever the rules are, and you know that leaves open that question of what should the rules be in these various different types of murky conflicts. But whatever rules you pick, you bake them into the machine, and the machine strikes me as somewhat unlikely to say, "We are not going to obey your rules. We are turning on you." You know, that that's the there's this fantasy that the robots all turn on us, and and maybe they will, but but. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Sixty million people killed in World War II, and not one. Not by one a robot. robot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to ask one question in closing. You know, you write a lot about your own personal experience in here, and some of that, uh, as you say, uh, I'm sure was publisher driven, but some of it's very personal and and really really uh, quite compelling, both at the level of of your experience at DoD, but also in the family that you grew up in. Uh, and in the human rights work that you did in um, in Uganda, particularly, and 
And so I'm, I'm just interested in a sort of open-ended sense in, in your, your sense of what the role of your personal experience says were in the development of this thesis and, and, and this set of ideas. Well, so for those of you who haven't read the book, um, I come from a family of left-wing anti-war activists. I ended up working at the Pentagon and marrying an army officer and, and uh, uh, you know, I've worked within human rights groups. I've, I've obviously, I, I teach now. Um, I've worked for the U.S. government, so there's a slightly schizophrenic set of uh, imperatives. Um, but I, I think that, you know, one of the results of that that upbringing and background was never quite feeling that I fit into any given culture. You know, growing up in a lefty anti-war family in a very blue-collar Republican town, for instance, um, and having a very acute sense of, gosh, we don't fit in. Everybody thinks we're weird. And, and, and then uh, becoming someone with a human rights background at a place like the Pentagon. Um, um, but then going back and being someone with a, with a sort of set of credentials that related to defense and military issues in the human rights community, and everybody looks at you like you're weird. And, 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 I, and I think that the, the good thing, I actually <laughs> remember talking to my younger brother about this, the good thing about growing up feeling like you don't quite fit in is that you don't feel any imperative to fit in. You know, you take it, if you take it for granted that you don't quite fit into any group, then you're not working that hard to win the approval of any given group, which liberates you enormously to say what you think and follow your own thoughts and your own conscience and your imagination where they go rather than being starting out from a position of constraint of we are supposed to think like this, we are supposed to think like that, if you don't feel like you're part of a we. Um, so in that sense, I, 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 I'm acutely aware that there are contradictory themes in, in the book in some ways, and they mirror the sort of contradictory elements of my own experience. Um, but I, I hope, at least, that sometimes, uh, at least, you know, you figure what's your batting average, you don't get everything perfect, but I, I hope that at least, at least enough of the time that the product of those, those competing perspectives gets me to somewhere that maybe is a little hard, harder for other people to get to because they're more part of particular groups, but that will make them also say, hey, wow, you know, I, I'm glad somebody thought of that because I didn't think of that, I hope. Rosa, thanks very much for joining us. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Thanks this week to the Hoover Institution for hosting the event and providing audio. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan, whose job has yet to be taken over by a mutinous killer robot. And as always, please spread the word and promote the Lawfare podcast via your social networks on Twitter, Facebook, and email. <laughs>